with our Revolutionary Living series, Acts chapter 13. The entire chapter will be uh, a basis for our time together today, but we're just going to lift up um, some specific verses. Just a reminder, Acts is written by Luke, and it is designed to share about how the first church came to be, and how the gospel was spread, right, through um, the first church, the established church. All right, Acts chapter 13. Let's start reading at verse 13. We'll read through 16, and then we'll skip over to verse 40, 42. Then Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Persia of Pamphylia. John, however, left them and returned to Jerusalem. But they went from on from Persia and came to Antioch of Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading of the law and the prophets, the officials of the synagogue sent them a message saying, Brothers, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, give it. So Paul stood up and with a gesture began to speak. So let's skip over to verse 42. He pretty much preaches this sermon, right? Reaccounting part of the Israelite history that is recorded in the Old Testament. Verse 42. As Paul and Barnabas were going out, the people urged them to speak about these things again the next Sabbath. When the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts of Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who spoke to them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and blasphemy. They contradicted what was spoken by Paul. Then both Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken first to you, since you rejected and judged yourselves to be unworthy of eternal life. We are now turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have set you to be a light for the Gentiles, so that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and praised the word of the Lord, and as many as been destined for eternal life became believers. Thus the word of the Lord spread throughout the region. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city and stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their region. So they shook the dust off their feet in protest against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Say thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Stay focused under adverse conditions. Let's bow for a word of prayer. God, we have already asked that in our time today, that as we offer worship and praise to you, that you would also speak back to us. And so God, we ask all of us, individually and collectively, that you will work in us, in our hearts, in our minds, in our ears, that we may hear you, that we may receive from you, and that we may grow in response to your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Indignation can be a very painful thing. Indignation is this feeling that we have been unjustly wronged, right? And so it becomes anger and frustration, right? Based upon something we feel like we are justified, <coughs> right? And I know that even when indignation is rightly placed, even though it's usually based on our perceptions of other people, and yes, our perceptions are often wrong, but even when our perceptions of other people are right, indignation when played upon can really spiral out of control and take us to places we have probably promised never to go with. I know this firsthand because I did it last night. <laughs> I did. It was all within me, right? As I was having a conversation with someone that I love very deeply, I was indignant, she was indignant, neither one of us would back down, and it felt like a matter of justice. If you're like, no, I'm right about this and you need to get it. Right? So much so that when I finally hung up the phone, right? My husband had heard my whole side. So we start reflecting on it and talking through it. And I came to realize that.
that my need to be right in that situation hindered me from first loving her the way I needed to love her. And it actually did more damage to the relationship than it did help. It kept me from backing down because I wasn't recognizing my own stuff in the midst of it. And that was a humbling moment for me. This is a humbling moment for me. Imagine me going through that on the eve of having to preach this on my <laughs> Staying focused <laughs> under adverse conditions. Thank you, Jesus. So I am not high and mighty <laughs> as I am standing before you today. Indignation is at the heart of the adversity in this passage. If we look at the beginning of chapter 13, what we find is that Paul, often still referred to as Saul, because his name changed back in chapter 8, right? And Barnabas and several other disciples are worshiping during a time of fasting and prayer, all right? And while they are worshiping and fasting and praying, they receive confirmation from God that, that Saul or Paul and Barnabas are to be sent out, right? So they have this ceremony, a laying on of hands, which is like our ordination process, right? So both God sends them and the church body sends them out on this task because God has given this directive. Now I think it is important for us to note here that they don't go first. And then find themselves in a jacked up situation and then start fasting and praying. Right? right? They fast and pray first. Yeah. And then respond to being sent. Right? Fasting and prayer precedes and prompts the going out. So they go. They travel to Salamis first and they do some work there. And then they find themselves traveling to Antioch in Pisidia. Alright? And once they um, arrive there, they do what we've done this morning. They go to church. They go to the synagogue for worship. They come in, they sit down, right? And they just chill. And in like fashion, right, someone notices them and recognizes them, one of the officials, and they write a note. You write notes to the church, right? <laughs> Try not to be distracted, but trust me, we see everything from what we do, right? So they send them a note saying, hey, if you have a word of encouragement, please. Stand up and give it. So this is what prompts Paul to stand and pretty much give a sermon. And he, he makes a very compelling argument. If you go back and read chapter 13, which I encourage you to do, if you go back and read chapter 13, you will find that he knows the audience he's speaking to. He's speaking to the Jewish audience, right? And as a result, he takes their story, a story that they know well. Everybody in the synagogue knows the story that he tells. And he uses that story to connect to how they are connected to Jesus. So he uses their story to affirm why Jesus is the Savior, right? And people are compelled and moved by that, so much so that they actually ask him to come back and speak again next week, right? After synagogue gets out, you know, all the, the Jews, they're coming around and doing such a good job. I just want to encourage you, keep going in the Lord, right? We didn't make that up. Standing at the door, no, it's been happening for a long time. Right? So they're, they're encouraging him. So we know that word travels fast, right? But we always say that bad news travels fast, but good news travels fast too. Sometimes we need to acknowledge that, right? So the word gets out, and this guy has been preaching and teaching and how good it is that he's going to preach again, right? And the following week, when they show up to speak, nearly the entire city of folk are there. Jews and Gentiles. Now, who is a Gentile? Most of us in here are Gentile. And I say most because I don't know who has a Jewish ancestry. A Gentile is anyone who is not Jewish. Right? So all the people have come. And when the Jews who invited them to speak see the crowds of people who have come, they are filled with jealousy. Notice they didn't say that they felt jealous. They are Field, F-I-L-L-E-D. It's almost as if there is a material substance that's in them. And when we're filled with anything, it is that thing that dictates how we view ourselves, how we view others, and how we view this world. And how our views are dictates how we behave. Right? right? How we respond in certain situations. They are filled with jealousy, and they are irate, and they go off. And so Paul and Barnabas say, ho, 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 wait a minute. Now, we have to come and share this with you first. That was our mandate. But we are also mandated to share this with all people, with all Gentiles.
house so that the word of the Lord can go. Salvation of Christ can reach all the ends of the earth. The Gentiles who are there, they all excited. They're like, oh yeah, we, we own this. We like this. Right? And the word says that the word of the Lord spread throughout the region. Right? But those who are filled with jealousy, they are blinded and blocked by this feeling. Right? By how much they are consumed by this thing. And they start to solicit um, the folk who are high ranking in the city, right? Those elite women, right? Those socialites. These leading men who are, you know, high officials. They solicit them and they persecute Paul and Barnabas and they drive them out of the city. And our account tells us that when they get outside of the city, they literally, and I do believe that they literally do this, as a symbol, they shake the dirt from that city off their feet, right? As both a sign that their responsibility to the city has ended, but also they're not carrying that rejection right. with them into the next point, right? So there are a lot of angles that we can take in looking at this passage of scripture. But today we're gonna to be talking specifically about how Paul and Barnabas teach us how to stay focused under adverse conditions. There's three ways they all connect, so they'll begin to weave, all right? The first thing that Paul and Barnabas teach us is that we are to guard against moving before God goes. We are to guard against moving before God goes, all right? So when Paul and Barnabas arrive in Antioch, they come and they sit in the synagogue, right? They don't demand to speak, right? They don't try to manipulate and finagle this opportunity to speak, right? They simply make themselves available, right? So many times, right, we are constantly trying to manifest opportunities because we say we're called to do something and we get ahead of God, right? But in my experience, if God has gifted you, right, and called you, then God will also provide the opportunity for those two things to meet and for that, that opportunity to come for you to serve right. and That's use right. that call. Right. Right. right? So Paul and Barnabas are very secure in their gift and their call. Sometimes when we're insecure in what we're called to do or insecure in our gift, we feel like we have to prove it. Right? We gotta be in this place, we gotta be doing this now, we gotta be moving right now in order to prove that this is what we got. Right? But no, that's a part of maturity. Being able to be secure in who you are and serving where God has you, right? Until God opens up that space. Amen. I served as the dean of the chapel, small university in North Carolina, and I can't tell you how many times I got calls from random people or from alumni saying, you know, well, God has called me to come and preach to these kids. <laughs> or the number of people said, well, I would have come and started my church on your campus. And I would say, well, you know, do you know that we have church on campus? <laughs> oh, no, 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 I didn't, I didn't know you had a church on campus. Or it would be, well, how many people come to the church on campus? How effective is the church <laughs> on campus, right? Because they are often, and I'm not saying that people didn't have a, a genuine intention to serve God, right? Sometimes we're just blinded by our own selfish desires, right? I'm not saying that they didn't have a genuine intention to love and serve God. But what I am saying is that sometimes we try to create opportunities by asking for opportunities that God isn't ready for us to walk into. Right? And if we are secure in who we are, we feel confident in who God has created us to be, right? Without being arrogant, we're humble men. Right? But we're confident enough in who we are that we can wait for God to provide those opportunities and God will. Proverbs 18 tells us that a gift <coughs> opens a door. Right? And it grants access to the great. Right? Amen. Now I know this is really contrary to how we operate in the world. Right? The world especially, the corporate world tells us that we are supposed to be constantly, aggressively seeking opportunities. Right? And I'm not saying we shouldn't have our eyes open and that we should not be available. Right? But being available and making, trying to make opportunities manifest are two totally different things. And it's been my experience that in every area of our lives as believers, right? In every area of our lives, if we are serving God and using the gifts God has given us, God will always open the door, whatever area that is in, to move us to the next level. Right? So the first thing they teach us is to 
not move or to guard against moving before God moves, right? Because God moves us when we have the proper tools, the proper wisdom and discernment to deal with what he's taking us to. We can't see what's on the other side of that room. God can. All right? The second thing God teaches us is that we are to resist the initial urge to quit. Resist the initial urge to quit. Now, Paul and Barnabas end up leaving the city, right? But they don't leave it because they are fleeing the hostility of that city, that city, right? They're not fleeing a very difficult situation. They leave it because they are driven out, right? So many times, as soon as hostility comes up, as soon as an adverse situation comes up, we're ready to just quit. I'm done. Right? Or we get to a place where we feel like we should be at a different place in our life. I should be further along by now. Right? So since I'm not, I'm just going to give up. Right? But they don't quit. Right? They speak when they're asked to be spoken, when, they, when they're asked to speak, and they leave when they're asked to leave. Yeah. Right? Not before. On either account. There's a story about a man who was a prospector for gold. He was looking for gold in the hills. He was convinced that he could find a great amount of gold in the hills. And so he would get up early every morning and he would take his simple tools and he would go and he would just dig and dig and dig. And he would find gold here and there, but nothing to get really excited about, right? Kept digging, kept digging, kept digging. And he finally said, you know what? I'm not gonna find any gold in these hills. So he gave up, he said, I'm quitting. Someone else who was a prospector of gold in the area heard that this man had quit, because everybody knew he went up in the needles every day, right? So he comes to him, he says, I want to buy your tools from you. He says, okay, fine. So he sells the tools for as much as he can get them for, right? This new prospector, he takes the tools, he hires a land surveyor, he hires an engineer, he hires a geologist, and all the work that they do, they combine it together, and they discover that this man, the first man who was digging, was only three feet away from the gold reserve in that hill. Three feet he could have reached out and touched him. Right? And so when this man hears this, all he can think to himself is of what might have been. Right? Sometimes we quit too soon. We quit too soon. And all I'm saying is I know you can get really deep in and you are trying to figure out is this just, did I move too soon and I shouldn't have gone down here anyway? All I'm saying is resist the initial urge to quit. And I know it gets hard, trust me. I, 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 I deal with this a lot. I do. I've been in so many circumstances where I get to a place where I'm like, okay, God, really, are you serious <laughs> telling me that I did what you asked me to do? All right. right? I'm trying to do what's right. I'm trying to make the right decisions. I'm trying to love both. I'm trying to be what I'm supposed to be. Right? <laughs> I'm repenting when I'm supposed to repent. <laughs> right? And both still lying on me. Right? right? Unexpected bills still coming in. I'm still gaining weight. <laughs> no, I'm quitting. I'm quitting. I'm quitting. <laughs> and there have been several times that God has reminded me of another conversation in my husband's wisdom. That he told me we were dating at the time. And I was in one of my I quit modes. I'm going to quit. No, I'm done with this. Right? <laughs> and then he said to me, oh, maybe it'll be all right by the time you get married. Now, the first thing I think is, what you mean by that? How long is it going to take you to <laughs> What you mean, how long am I going to be waiting? <laughs> like, I am. But he then went on to explain that this is what his mama used to say to him when he was a little boy. And it was her way of saying, this too shall pass. One of the main ways that we can make sure that we resist the initial urge to quit we do that by making sure that we are mindful of the fact that we do not treat temporal situations as if they are permanent. <laughs> this too shall pass. Third way, that they teach us to stay focused under adverse conditions is to keep the main thing the main thing. In order to do this, we have to be very mindful of our inner motivations, right? Our self-thoughts, our desires, the kind of drive us inside, right? Because it can be easy for us to begin to get distracted, right, if we aren't careful about what is driving us and motivating us, yeah. right? 
Keep the main thing. The what? Main the thing. main thing. One of my closest friends um, and mentors, Dr. Quincy Scott Jr., is a retired colonel from the Army. He's a chaplain in the Army. And one of the things that has always amazed me about Dr. Scott, and I am convinced that God put him in my life to teach me this specific lesson over and over and over again, because we have had this conversation right in these times. Every time I see Dr. Scott, every once in a while he may get angry and agitated, but I've never seen him in a, a prolonged period of anxiousness or work. And I am interested in that. Like, how do you do that? Right? Like, write it out for me. Show me. Teach me that. Right? And I can recall one of the lessons in him teaching me this. I was dealing with actually an acquaintance of his. And this man was working my last nerve about a situation that was very unfortunate that I was connected to, but that I had no control over. He was calling me three and four and five times a day, right? And I felt like he was unfairly trying to manipulate my emotions. And I felt bad about how it worked out, but I didn't have any control over it, right? But I'm really upset at this point because this man keeps calling me. Like, why do you still have my number? Like, that is one of the only times I've ever thought about changing my life. I've had my number for how many years? 13. Right? So, I go in and I sit in Dr. Scott's office. I said, Dr. Scott, I know this man is your friend. He says, well, he's in a hundred. <laughs> I said, well, whatever. <laughs> and I said, and I know he has some good attributes and everything, but he keeps calling me, and I feel like he is overreacting, and he is getting on my last nerve. And Dr. Scott, in his wisdom, he kind of sits back in his chair. He has this nice, calm smile on his face. He says, well, Donna, it seems to me that you should be upset with yourself. Mm -hmm. I said, why? He calling me. I'm not calling him. What you talking about? I said, oh, I should be answering the phone. <laughs> <laughs> he says, no, no. He says, I'm saying this because you are allowing him to control your emotions. Amen. You are allowing him to dictate to you how you respond and feel on a regular basis. He says, yes, he's overreacting. I get that, right? He's like, but you've done what you're supposed to do, and you're allowing this to distract you to the point that your everyday tasks are not getting done because you keep thinking about this over and over again in your head. Right? It's on this loop, and all that emotion starts coming back to you. He says, no, that's not your stuff. It's not about you. He said, this is not about you. He says, you cannot allow the stuff that's about him, right, to manage and dictate how you feel. Right? And this is it. This is where we got to be because we sometimes allow stuff to distract us that we don't intend to distract us. Right? Because we get caught up owning somebody else's stuff that's not our stuff to be yeah. responsible for. Right? They didn't need to manage their jealousy. That wasn't theirs to manage. They had a task, and they had to stay focused on the task. And they had to know in that moment that your jealousy doesn't really have anything to do with me. It's your yeah. own stuff yeah. you got going on. But when we allow stuff ourselves to relive, because I often believe, as I was reading this passage, if somebody drove me out of a city when I was trying to bring salvation to their city, it would have been hard for me to just shake the dust. Right? I would have shook the, shook the dust off my feet and the dust still would have been in my head. Right? Because we relive stuff. And I think I've said in this space once before that our brains, literally, physically, our brains do, does not, do not tell the difference between a memory and an actual experience that's happening now. That's why you can experience something, right? This is what Dr. Hansen, who wrote Rudy's Brain, calls the first part. You can experience something and all the suffering and pain dealing with that. And then it can be days, weeks, years later, and you can remember it in the same way. And all of those emotions come back. Exactly like you experienced it. Right? Unless you are taking the proper steps to heal from those experiences so that you can let them go. Right? A part of this is the process of forgiveness. Well, I'm not talking about forgiveness, but I'm just saying. <laughs> right? Unless you're stepping through the proper channels to make sure you are able to shake the dust off your feet, you will live and relive in that place of suffering. And it is a place of torture that we often bring on ourselves because we aren't doing what we need to do. They kept the main thing the main thing. Because they did not take on other people's stuff. Right? They were able to release it. 
I'm not taking this rejection with me. Right? That stuff starts to build up as we keep going on and on and on. And I think the most powerful part about this passage is found in verse 49. And that is despite the adversity, right? Now, adversity means hostility, right? But it also can mean um, hindering success, right? Or something that tries to hinder success. So despite the fact that the intention was to hinder success, verse 49 tells us that success was not hindered, which tells us what? That adversity alone is not strong enough to hinder the purpose that God has put in place. Right? It alone cannot stop us. How we respond to adversity can. But in and of itself, it's not strong enough. It's not powerful enough. So I don't know exactly where you are right now. I don't know what difficult situations you're in. I don't know what difficult relationships you're in. I don't know what difficulties are going on in your family, on your job, right? Or even just within yourself. I don't even know what difficulties we're going to face as a church moving forward to do what God is asking to do. Because sometimes adversity does come because we're doing the right thing. Yes. Right? Yes. We are not exempt from adversity. We are not exempt from hostility. Everybody experiences. We are not special. Right? right? I don't know what that is, but I do know that God will still have the purpose and the success to be to, to manifest if we are careful about how we respond in these situations. Yes. Staying focused. And we talk a lot about spiritual disciplines. And spiritual disciplines are not about being perfect. It's not about salvation. We are saved by grace. Yes. Yes. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves. Right? But spiritual disciplines is about how we grow in loving God and other people and ourselves. Right? The precedence of this passage, the power of this passage, is found in their practice of the disciplines. Fasting and prayer specifically. Right? If you want to know more about the disciplines, because we've been talking about it all this summer, right? I suggest that you get a book. Marcel's going to put it up on the board for us. The Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster. You want to read more? Celebration of Discipline. This will take you through all of the disciplines. It will give you a good overview. All right? It'll give you a good catalyst. It'll give you scripture and all of that. If you want to know more about fasting specifically, right? Because we are not a culture that fasts that often. Or that diligently. Or in the right way. Right? We say we're going to fast, and by the end of the day, that fast has changed like five times. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> I ain't by myself. <laughs> The Sacred Art of Fasting, Preparing and Practice is one of the best books I've ever read on fasting. Very clear, very concise, gives you a good understanding of why we fast for faith purposes. All right? Both of these can probably be found at your library, your local library. If you want more wisdom and discernment, which is what really gives us the meat of how to operate in situations like this, pray for it. Right? Ask, and it shall be given. Pray for it. But I also want you to be prepared when you start praying for stuff like wisdom, for God to be giving you experiences that you have that require the use of wisdom. So how we learn from stuff like wisdom and patience is by God giving us chances to practice. So don't get surprised when people start working your nerves and stuff just start going haywire. You need to recognize that as God answering your prayer. God, there is nothing to work. God, there's no amount of hurt or pain that we can experience, God, that you can't reach and touch. There's nothing so broken that is beyond the repair of your hands. God, I know we speak these words all the time, but I'm asking you now in Jesus' name to give us the faith and the conviction in our spirits to believe it in such a way that we can embody it and live it. Lord, I pray that when we walk out of here today, God, that we will live our lives in a way that says that we are eternal. That we will live our lives in such a way that says that we have a God who has made us promises and never goes back to his promises. We will live our lives in such a way that says we are content where we are, God, and you can give us joy exactly where we are. God, we will live our lives in such a way that, that we believe, God, that you will never put us to shame, Almighty God. 
Lord, we will live our lives in such a way, Almighty God, that we believe that the things that we speak and pray for, as long as they are in line with your will, God, they will manifest and come to fruition. God, we will live our lives in such a way, God, that says that no matter how little or how much we have, God, that we know that you are a God that is good, and you are a God who makes right the wrong things in our life, and you are a God who heals, and you are a God who delivers, and you are a God who transforms, and you are a God who transcends circumstances, and you are a God who brings us peace in the midst of adversity, and you are a God who increases joy in our life, and you are a God who makes ways, God, and we think ways are impossible.